Welcome everybody. This is the Musella Foundation's Brain Tumor Awareness Month webinar series. Tonight we have two special guests. Uh, our first topic is perfusion MRI of brain tumors uh, by Mark Shiryoshi. Um, he's a neuroradiologist and assistant professor in the USC Department of Radiology. Um, Mark, take it away. Okay, thanks Dr. Masella, and thanks for the kind invitation to speak to you all today about a rather technical topic. And so I'm gonna try to hopefully make it as, as understandable for all of you as possible. And we're talking about perfusion MRI of brain tumors. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. And I'm just gonna talk about some of the general principles and applications, particularly as it relates to glioma imaging um, and talk about the importance of standardization and talk about how some of the advances in, in how we do perfusion imaging has impacted us at USC. Uh, and so, yes, so let's go into, into why we're doing this. So the most common way, as you all know, to uh, evaluate and, and uh, follow a brain tumor from diagnosis to throughout the therapy is to look at it with MRI. And most of the time, um, the, the, the standard of care is to do a contrast enhanced MRI, meaning that you inject the dye the gadolinium-based contrast agents, the dye that you inject into your arm. And it's important because tumors um, enhance. They, this is normal brain here, and you see all this white stuff here. This is an enhancement of a lesion here that could be a tumor. And uh, high-grade gliomas in particular, uh, and particularly uh, glioblastomas, the grade four, the most aggressive ones enhance quite a bit and they are very heterogeneous looking and they're very thick and they have some areas in the center that don't enhance that are thought to be cysts or necrosis and they can look um, quite, uh, quite heterogeneous and, 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 and aggressive. And so what, what the, uh, you know, the, main, the, the standard care therapy is to do surgery. So this person had a high grade glioma over here and this was resected by surgery and then um, you follow it with imaging every few months or so. And then you get your um, chemo radiation with temozolomide, which is a standard of care upfront for newly diagnosed high-grade gliomas. And very often, uh, unfortunately, you'll find that many patients start to develop these new or increasing lesions. Now, sometimes it's not always possible to completely resect the tumor. The, the brain is different from you know, other organs uh, in the body. You can't be super aggressive and and, and, and just cut out as much as you want because you are dealing with the brain and the surrounding structures are, are often important for many um, motor and sensory and cognitive functions, for example. And so you, it's, it's always a risk to benefit ratio as to how much you want to actually cut out. Um, there, there's definitely benefit to taking out as much tumor as possible. However, again, you, there's always you know, a risk benefit calculation that you have to make. But in many patients after the chemo radiation, you find that the, you get these new enhancing lesions here. And the question is, what is that? How much of that is tumor? And how much of that is what we refer to as post-treatment radiation effect? You may also hear terms like pseudo progression or radiation necrosis, just depending on how early in the time course after the radiation, you're looking at these things. So definitely, uh, so in the first three to six months, Sometimes people will use the term pseudo progression. If you see a new or an increasing enhancing lesion like this, where the dye leaks out into the extravascular extracellular space, and um, if it's after three to six months, depending on who you, what paper you read, then they refer to this as possibly radiation necrosis. But the problem is um, whether it's post treatment radiation effect, you know, pseudo progression or radiation necrosis, it's very difficult, if not nearly impossible, to distinguish that post-treatment radiation effect from progressive tumor because they can both look almost identical. There are some, uh, you know, some, some older radiologists who believe in like if, if it's very solid, then it's tumor. And if it's more fluffy or not solid, that, it, that it's um, not uh, tumor and that's post-treatment radiation effect. But there's really no good studies to support that. So we're, we need better techniques to um, try to hammer this out and using conventional imaging, uh, it's just using the, you know, the contrast enhanced imaging isn't really the, the, um, the most accurate way. And so we need other methods. And so perfusion MRI has been around for many years and we'll talk a little bit 
uh, more about the technical details. Uh, and, and I think that's that's one helpful method that that can help us to try to differentiate the two issues. Now, there are if you look in the literature, you will find thousands and thousands of articles uh, in the neuroimaging literature trying to distinguish um, uh, post treatment radiation effect from progressive tumor uh, using different techniques: perfusion MRI, diffusion MRI, PET MRI, PET. Uh, nuclear medicine techniques, all kinds of different techniques have been tried. Uh, and it can be quite, quite daunting and over, overwhelming to kind of look at each study by themselves. One good thing to, to try to look into are what we call systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And, and what these are, are a way to, to synthesize all these data. And now though, there are all kinds of reviews that are in the literature. Most of them are what we call sort of narrative reviews where They'll ask an expert to, um, to write about a topic and that person will go into the literature and kind of try to summarize everything. On the other hand, a systematic review is different in that it's a much more rigorous uh, type of review where you have to have uh, methodology, just like a scientific, original scientific uh, article. And it could take you know, up to a year, year and a half, depending on, on how big of a review you're looking at and how big the field is. And then once you do that and you you look at all the studies after doing a very rigorous uh, uh, analysis uh, of the literature, then you have to decide whether or not you can combine all the numbers from the different studies together. And that's what's called the meta-analysis. So sometimes a systematic review just ends at a systematic review because you realize that the, the, the way that the numbers were derived were so heterogeneous that they, you can't scientifically justify combining them. But sometimes they're similar enough to combine into a, a where you pull all the numbers together and you get the so-called meta-analysis and you get a, new, a quantitative, a numerical uh, evaluation of the data rather than just a, a qualitative. So th there have been a number of systematic reviews and meta-analysis looking at perfusion MRI in this post-therapy setting. So after the person has had maximal safe surgery and after they've had the temozolomide chemo radiation, how well does uh, perfusion MRI uh, function in terms of accuracy to differentiate uh, progressive tumor from post-treatment radiation effect. And they found that it has got relatively good accuracy when you're looking at sensitivities and specificities, true positive and true negative fractions. These are just different methods of looking at accuracy and they're bordering on 90%, 88%, much better than just using the conventional imaging, in which case you're basically kind of just guessing. And really what you would you end up doing in this case is just following this up. And we'll have, we'll, I'll show you a, a, a nice example at the end of the lecture of how perfusion MRI can really help because in general, what people will do is they will just follow this up. And over time, if the, the lesion stabilizes or gets smaller, then they'll just assume that it's post-treatment radiation effect. If the lesion just gets bigger and bigger and bigger over successive imaging blocks, usually you know, every few weeks or every month or so when they image them, then they'll assume that it's tumor. And then they'll just decide that whatever treatment they're doing that, that is not working and that needs to change. But the caveat with this meta-analysis and many others that have been done looking at perfusion MRI is that there's still a lot of variability in the reported threshold. So each study, the methodology in terms of how you acquire and process the data is similar, but but the, because of the lack of uniformity, the thresholds that people report between one and the other are quite variable. And as a result, we need more standardization. So it's not like, you know, I, ideally perfusion MRI and other types of imaging, uh, this is not uh, 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 unique to only perfusion weighted imaging. If you look at all kinds of other imaging, there are very few universal numbers that um, are true across the board because of the problems, and especially with MRI types of techniques, MRI is so complicated that it's very difficult to establish uh, these uh, uniform numbers. So like blood pressure, for example, there are clear cut numbers for what is considered normal blood pressure and what's considered abnormal blood pressure. And those can change over time, but generally you're not too worried about differences in the blood pressure machines. But with MRI, you, you kind of are worried about the different machines and we'll talk about how standardization uh, is becoming a bigger issue. This is a little bit more technical here. Um, when I say perfusion MRI, we're talking about 
dynamic susceptibility contrast of DFC perfusion. We're not going to be talking so much about DCE perfusion, but suffice it to say that you, in order to do perfusion imaging, you do rapid imaging before, during, and after when you inject this contrast dye into your arm. And so you think of it as looking at a, 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 a moving picture, like a film, rather than the conventional MRI, you're looking at just like a snapshot, like a Polaroid snapshot in time. You're looking at one picture in time here. This, we're just looking at one picture in time. This is conventional MRI. Whereas with per perfusion MRI, you're imaging before you inject the contrast dye, while the contrast dye is being injected into your arm, and after the contrast dye has been injected into your arm, you keep imaging for a couple of minutes to see what what the perfusion or uh, blood volume measurements are in that lesion. Um, these are just more some technical images here, uh, comparisons, but basically what happens is the signal in the brain gets darker when you do DSC perfusion imaging. This is an important cartoon here just to illustrate what happens uh, when we do perfusion imaging. So this is the perfusion technique we're going to be talking about, DSC perfusion. This is the most common perfusion technique that's used in the brain. This is also the basis of perfusion MRI that we do for the other major application of perfusion MRI, which is stroke imaging. Um, and basically, the, this yellow is the contrast agent, the, the, the dye. And what you're assuming is that the contrast agent dye, the, 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 the biophysical model that was developed many, many years ago as the basis for perfusion measurement using this technique is predicated on the idea that the contrast agent stays within the microvasculature, stays within the capillaries, and we're measuring perfusion at the small vessels. These are not the big vessels that you can see with your naked eye, like in the arteries or the veins. These are the vessels that are in the brain tissue that you really can't visualize with your eye, but the scanner can see these differences. And the main idea here is that the dye stays within the vessel. But we know that for high-grade gliomas and many other lesions that enhance, like that example I showed you, the contrast agent actually leaks out because the blood-brain barrier that is unique to the blood vessels in the brain is somewhat compromised. And so the contrast agent leaks out into the extravascular, extracellular space. So when that happens, that really complicates the measurement of the perfusion values. So the main perfusion value that is used to look at brain tumors is what's called relative cerebral blood volume. So in general, uh, high relative cerebral blood volume is generally not a good thing. It, it can be an indicator of progressive tumor, of a higher grade of tumor, whereas rel lower relative cerebral blood volume is good in brain tumors, indicating that's potentially just what we call post-treatment radiation effect. But again, this when, when, the, when the tumor enhances like this. This causes a lot of complication. And I'll show you here just some cartoons here showing you can get underestimation where the dip, when I said I showed you that cartoon where the, the line goes down, it may not go down very far, or you can get a situation where it goes down really far, depending on what's going on at the biophysical level in the tumor. So uh, you can get either underestimation of your RCBV, your relative cerebral blood volume, or you can get overestimation of your relative cerebral blood volume. And to make things even more complicated, you can get both under or, or and overestimation in the same lesion. And so um, this makes the calculation a little complicated. Uh, so one, one simple way that people have thought about to try to fix this issue. Now, this is not an issue with stroke because strokes um, by and large, don't have that contrast leakage. You don't get that contrast enhancement. Uh, the, 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 lead, the stroke does not light up on the brain scan as it does with, with high-grade gliomas. So in this case, people thought, why don't we just give a preload of this dye? All that means is if you inject uh, an, an initial dose of the contrast agent into your arm, you wait five or 10 minutes, and then you inject the second time to do your dynamic imaging to get your perfusion data. Um, and it was thought that if it did that, it would leak out into the extravascular extracellular space, it would enhance. And then the second time you injected the dye, it would decrease the leakage effect that the leakage effects I talked about. And at the time, we didn't really know um, what was an appropriate dose. We thought maybe a quarter to a full dose that you normally give a patient 
would be appropriate because that's what most people were doing and it seemed reasonable, but we really didn't have the data, the, the data didn't exist to substantiate uh, uh, one, one, that one was better than the other. Another just dealt with the flip angle. This is another technical thing about the, the sequence itself. We settled on 60 degrees because it was between 90 and 30. This is a compromise between how much signal you're going to get. So you want a technique that's going to give you high signal so that you don't get really noisy images that'll make interpretation difficult. But then there's when you have high signal, you can also get a lot of uh, susceptibility to leakage effects. And so you wanted 60 degrees as a compromise in between. Again, that sounded reasonable. But again, not a lot of empiric proof. Because again, this is just based on expert opinion and our knowledge of physics principles of MRI. Interestingly, uh, recently, Kathleen Schmeinder's group showed that if you use a low flip angle instead of the 60, and you didn't use the, the preload, and you use the software leakage correction algorithms that I'll talk about in a little bit, that, that, I mean, that might be pretty good also, and that, that can impact the way we do imaging. So I, so I was part of this, this white paper that came out in 2015 that tried to talk about the lack of standardization. And at that time, it was predicated on these things I talked about, giving a preload, meaning that you inject the dye initially once before you inject the, the dye for the actual perfusion imaging. You use this intermediate flip angle of 60 degrees. You use a model, a field strength dependent TE, which just depends on whether you do three Tesla or 1.5 Tesla MRI. And then you need to use what's called model-based leakage correction. All that means is that you, the software that you use can be very important as well because there are different ways of, um, there, there are different ways to correct for the leakage using software, using a mathematical correction. So one way to correct is to do, give the preload where you give that dose of the, the contrast dye before. That's one way. And the second way is when you're actually getting your numbers and you're crunching your numbers, you need a mathematical algorithm to try to correct for the other leakage effects that could still be um, hanging around when the, that the preload didn't fix. And, there are different model-based leakage correction algorithms out there. Uh, and so in 2018, there was a study by Chad Quarles' group who's at Barrow uh, in, in Arizona, and they actually used computer simulations of glioblastoma patients. And so they, they took the different parameters and they found that the, that the thing I talked about was 60 degree and using a single preload dose. Uh, with the full dose for the for the for the perfusion imaging actually had the best accuracy and precision at 1.5 tesla and 3 3 t so accuracy is how close are you to the actual value using some sort of gold gold uh, gold standard in this case they they knew that these patients were gbm patients and precision is if you were to repeat this re repeat something how close would the measurements be so they're kind of related but 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 different so you want Ideally, you want something that's highly accurate, meaning that it's close to the, that it's the truth that it's true. And B, every time you do it, you're still going to get the similar measurement because it's possible to have some things that are accurate but not very precise, or some things that are not very accurate but always getting always precise. And then the worst situation is where you have something that's neither accurate nor precise. But ideally, you want something that's both accurate and precise for it to to be used uh, for for anything obviously as important as medicine. Uh, it, but interestingly, again, they seem to have the same idea that using a low, instead of 60, using 30 degrees, perform nearly as well uh, without, using a, without using a preload. Now, we started, um, we changed, we modernized the way that we did perfusion imaging back uh, in September of 2020, using a lot of the work uh, with Jerry Boxerman, Kathleen Schmeinder, um, using their Boxerman, Weisskopf, Schmeinder, it's a, it's, Basically, they have a mathematical algorithm in their software that has been, it's the most validated in terms of accuracy of the perfusion values with tumor grade uh, compared to any other algorithm out there. So we started in, uh, using, using um, um, their technique uh, and you should be using some kind of software leakage correction in addition to the preload to get the most accurate perfusion values. Um, in addition, their technique also has a, a unique system called standardization of your perfusion values. Most other perfusion measurement, measurements that are used on the outside have, don't have the standardized technique. And so what it means is that the values that you get 
what are called signal intensities that you get on an MRI picture, they um, can be, ar they're arbitrary. Signal intensity values on MRI are arbitrary. It sounds weird, but it is, it, you can take the same brain and scan them on different MRI scanners and you, the signal, the brightness of the same part of the brain will be different. And it's just an intrinsic property of the MRI itself for multiple reasons. Um, and so because of this variability, what people have done is here's a perfusion map showing the blood volume measurements in a, in a patient who has a tumor. And you can see that um, here is the tumor that I was showing you earlier. And in, if you're using conventional methods, you'll see that you have to do what's called normalization where radiologists will draw a region of interest around an area that they think is the hottest area that has the highest perfusion. And they'll draw a, a region of interest in the contralateral normal appearing white matter and the opposite side of the brain that they think mirrors the same area. And you come up with a ratio that's to, to account for the lack of standardization of the, the signal intensity, the brightness of the technique. Well, the method that we're using now, it uses these standardized measurements where it basically has a mathematical algorithm again that standardizes all the brightness values in all the MRI so that you don't have to do this anymore. Obviously, when you do something like this, this can introduce a lot of variability in the measurements because a radiologist might want to choose here or here or here. And then the normalizing uh, our region of interest on the other side could be anywhere. Uh, they moved it over here or here. That ratio then changes. And then so you can get tremendous user um, influence. The, the radiologist starts to influence the measurement. And that's not something that you really want to do. Um, and so standards, the standardized algorithm is really nice because you don't have to do this anymore. Another thing is that this, this technique also has, uh, utilizes is that the thresholds that they use um, is validated based on histo histopathologically validated tissue samples. So they actually took this method, the, the acquisition method that we talked about and, and the post-processing software that we talked about and they actually went and they got neurosurgeons to sample parts of the parts of the lesion. Now, this is the same situation where you've treated the patient with surgery and chemo radiation. You follow them up and they start developing this new or enlarging enhancing lesion. And the question is, well, is this tumor or this is post-treatment radiation effect or a mixture of both? What, what's going on? They actually use stereotypically guided biopsies, meaning that they got the MRI into the operating, the MRI images into the operating room and they got software to actually target this area. And they told the neurosurgeon, we want you to target this area that has a little bit of bright signal here on the perfusion map. And we want you to target that. And we wanna see, is that tumor or is that post-treatment radiation effect? And they did this on a number of studies led by Leland, Leland Hu and, and Kathleen Schmeiner's group and Melissa Pra. And they found that there were different thresholds using this particular acquisition uh, the way you acquire the images, as I said, with the 60 degree flip angle and so on, and the uh, model-based leakage correction software. And they were able to come up with very good thresholds uh, that were accurate to distinguish between tumor and non-tumor. And this allows you to create what are called fractional tumor burden maps. And these are very unique to this type of method. As I said, most places that will do perfusion don't have the ability to do these FTB maps. And so what, again, you're just drawing these regions of interest like this, or what a lot of places also do is they'll just kind of eyeball it and say, okay, this, some of this looks kind of hot over here. This is probably tumor. But in order to have more quantitative rather than subjective, you want quantitative uh, 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 values using the histopathologically validated thresholds that we talked about from, from the previous slide and also the standardization algorithm that's unique, you can get what are called fractional tumor burden maps. And so you don't have to draw any regions of interest. The computer just does this. It, it, is, you, it, it um, uh, obviates or prevents the, the radiologist from putting some variability in this. And you can now see that this, this enhancing lesion now is color-coded with these levels here. Blue is good. This is post-treatment radiation effect. Red is tumor. That's bad. And purple is a mixture of post-treatment radiation effect and tumor. And you could see now not only uh, the distributions and the percentages of this, but you can also see where the lesions are uh, relative. So if you were going to go and, and, and operate on this, you know that the anterior part, the front part here is worse than the stuff back here. 
So this is very helpful and has had a tremendous impact on the way that we look at patients. Because in the past, we were still relying upon these sorts of maps and kind of just making a judgment as to, well, maybe this part looks really hot and maybe over here doesn't look so hot. But now you look at it on here, it's much more clear where tumor is and exactly how much there is. And we're finding much more often that these lesions are not always one or the other. It's not all tumor and it's not all post-treatment radiation effect, either pseudoprogression or radiation uh, necrosis, uh, depending on the time course. Often it's a mix and you, you, most of our lesions show a mixture of blue, purple, and red. And I think it's still kind of unclear how to deal with this because uh, I think we need to look much more into this uh, conventionally, you know, doctors think of it, it's either radiation necrosis or post-treatment uh, uh, or progressive tumor. And in reality, when we're, when we're doing these FTB maps more and more, we're finding that it's actually a mixture of both. And so obviously when it's 90% tumor and 10% post-treatment radiation effect is going to be different from the opposite situation. But what do you do when it's like 50-50 or 60-40? Um, I think then it, there's much more work that needs to be done, but we're getting a lot more information um, from using this, these sort of techniques. And this has been tested in multiple uh, multi-center trials and it's found to be relatively robust, these methods that I talked about. Here's a case study. So this is a 76 year old lady at our institution who had a right temporal lobe anaplastic astrocytoma. So, so this is a grade three. This is still a high grade glioma. There's a one below the glioblastoma that had been resected back in November of 2015. And she was followed by uh, chemo radiation uh, with Temidar, well, that was completed in 2017. In 2019, she'd been followed up, and then there was a small focus of contrast enhancement in the right anterior temporal lobe that was treated with gamma knife. So this is stereotactic radio surgery. She didn't undergo open surgery or anything like that. They did radio, focal radiation therapy to it in January 2020, and she she completely she underwent MRI uh, surveillance through that time, and eventually she got reoperated on, and she was found to have glioblastoma. Now, so he went from grade three to grade four, but we'll just show you just from an imaging standpoint, how this, how this happened. So back in January of 2020, you have this area here. This is the first image that I showed you where I showed that she had an anaplastic astrocytoma here. And initially there was nothing here. And then she started developing a little bit of contrast enhancement, the, the, the dye leaking out into the uh, extravascular extracellular space anterior to the original area. Now, these gliomas are inherently um, infiltrated. And so there's always tumor that's left behind, even though you cut out, even, even if you cut out all the abnormality in the MRI, there's always tumor cells left because they're, they just infiltrate into the brain, sometimes even into the opposite side of the brain. But anyway, this is that little focus that they, they presumed was recurrence and they treated it with, with radiation therapy. Now that was in January, 2020. In March of 2020, it, uh, you see that the lesion got a little bit bigger. Now, this could be post-radiation effect as well, um, or is this tumor? And then she had a short interval follow-up a couple of weeks later. It was more or less about the same, depending on what slice you looked at. And it was, it, it, but then she, she was lost for follow-up for about five months. And she came back, and the thing is definitely larger. Still, is this tumor, or is this radiation effect, or is this both? You know, how much of it is uh, one or the other? And then you go uh, another month, the thing looks uh, largely stable, again, depending on what slice. And then two months later in November, you can see the thing is definitely larger. Now it has like two um, extensions here, and it's definitely bigger, and there's more contrast enhancement around the rim here and everything. And so she was finally operated on here. Now, we were trying to get the uh, approvals to turn on the, the, the software um, from, the, we had delays with contracts and, and grants, and, um, uh, our, 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 the, the administrative people. And it, we couldn't turn on the software till, no, till September, but we had been acquiring the, the perfusion algorithm even before that. And I went back retrospectively to take a look and you can see that back in March that most, that a good amount of this lesion was red and a little bit it was blue. But then five months later, you can see most of this thing is red with very little blue. And you can see here uh, in, in November when the thing is really big that the, the, the huge thing is now really red. There's, a, there's some blue back here now. Um, and then so she was operated on and the pathology was GBM. Now, you, so you can argue, had we been able to um, have, have everything turned on way back in March, we could have suggested maybe even closer follow-up and perhaps she could have been operated on many months before, um, but 
uh, so it could have it could have saved up to maybe about five six months uh, uh, of of waiting. Uh, to, to, as I said, you, just based on looking at this, you can't really tell how much of this is post treatment effect and how much of this is tumor. This is a case where most of this was tumor, a little bit was post treatment radiation effect, and so she went from grade three to grade four. Um, so that's why I think perfusion can really help. Um, in terms of just trying to standardize perfusion, there's a, a group called the Radiologic Society in North America. It's the largest radiology uh, organization uh, in the world dedicated to research and, and, and clinical education. And they have a biomarker committee that's trying to standardize. I've been working with Ona Wu from Harvard and Brad Erickson from Mayo Clinic to try to standardize the acquisition and the post-processing and we're gonna have a white paper coming out, hopefully in the next few months dedicated to just trying to advance some of these standardization techniques that we talked about. So in conclusion, I think MR, perfusion MRI shows good accuracy to distinguish post-treatment radiation effect from progressive tumor because conventional imaging really can't tell the difference. And as I said, thousands of articles have been published looking at perfusion imaging, diffusion imaging, PET imaging, all kinds of things beyond just conventional MRI to try to differentiate the two because you can't really tell just based on looking at um, the, the pre and post contrast enhanced images, the dye before and after injecting the dye. And so, but we need more standardization because we wanted to get to like blood pressure measurements or like uh, we, what we look at with um, blood coagulation parameters like PT, INR, um, in order to standardize differences between different laboratories. We need that still. but. The different studies all seem to show good accuracy. So, so different institutions have different thresholds, but there is no universal threshold throughout, throughout the field because of these differences. I think us incorporating this new standardized algorithm that I talked about with a model-based leakage correction um, and the fractional tumor burden maps has made a tremendous influence at USC for our brain tumor center to have more personalized care for these patients. And we're finding some patients have 90 to 10 tumor, some people have 50-50. And so the, the, the neuro oncologists are making different decisions as to wait, waiting and watching versus being more aggressive um, with these different tumors because the conventional imaging can look very similar uh, between progressive tumor and post-treatment radiation effect. And as I said, a lot of times you're seeing an admixture of both and um, what to do with the different threshold, the, the different proportions is still kind of uh, unclear. And that's about all I uh, have to say. Um, I wanna thank all the uh, staff at, at the Brain Tumor Center and all my colleagues in the perfusion community for all of their uh, input and help over time. Thanks. Thank you, that was very interesting. I love these FTP, uh, FTB maps. FTB maps yeah. uh, what is the status of them now? Are they available generally or just yeah. as experimentals? Yeah, like if I want to add it onto a regular MRI, you could order it? Yeah, I mean, so so this is one of the things you have to have that particular software, and that's what um, and and this is um, this is all the work of Kathleen Schmeinder at Medical College of Wisconsin, and um, you know she's been she has dedicated like thirty years of her her career looking at perfusion MRI, and um, yeah, it's widely commercially available, used at many brain tumor centers, but not you know you know, radiologists are like cats, you know, everyone has their own choice and there's different reasons why people choose different softwares. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've looked, I've spent the last 12 years of my career just looking at perfusion MRI and I found like their, their techniques seem to be the most validated, um, most quantifiable. Um, and I find that the, compared to what, what other things I've used to be much more helpful using these FTB maps, which you can only get using that, that particular acquisition and post-processing technique to be really helpful because you're finding that a lot of these lesions are not one, it's not a one and zero, you know, it's not black and white, it's, right. a, it's a mixture. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, to your knowledge, has this, uh, the FTB maps ever been used with the FDA to get a drug approved? I don't think so. I mean, Kathleen is uh, very intimately involved in brain tumor uh, uh, studies with the FDA, but to my knowledge, I don't, I don't think so. Well, so it would seem to be, this could be an endpoint in its, on its own to see that right. a tumor is getting more green, or uh, blue, whatever, I forget the colors already, yeah. less red. <laughs> yeah. uh, that would show that a drug is working much quicker than having to wait uh, a year to see if the person dies. Yeah, I don't believe so, but I mean, that might be a better question to ask Kathleen. I'm, I mean, I can ask her or I'm sure- We had her on as uh, for webinar last year. Maybe we'll, right. we'll talk to her again. Right, right. Uh,
let me see. Um, does this work uh, in the ponds, like for DIPG? There's no reason so, why it wouldn't. Yeah, so DIPG, I mean, it's 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 more of a pediatric tumor. And right. in fact, I just um, will be giving the, the, the perfusion MRI talk at the American Society of Neuroradiology meeting in uh, next week. This is our big society uh, uh, meeting uh, for, for brain imaging um, uh, in the US. And um, perfusion imaging has not been studied or used as much in the pediatric population because of a couple of issues. It can potentially, but one, a couple of things is that um, you're gonna need histopathologic biopsies to validate these things. And operating on the ponds, you know, in the brainstem is a hairy thing. It's often not done because of the risk to the patient because so many of the important uh, uh, tracks and the nuclei are in there and it could be um, uh, very bad to, to cause uh, bleeding into the, uh, into the brainstem. So often not biopsy. So that's one thing that would make it difficult. Secondly, perfusion imaging using this technique where you have to inject a dye is technically challenging in kids. And we were part of a study, uh, uh, the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium study, looking at uh, pontine gliomas a number of years ago, and the results were just published last year um, in, in children. Uh, they, you have to have, the IV access has to be decent. Uh, you have to use a power injector and the, 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 the dye has to be injected very quickly and often kids don't have that, um, that IV access. And so that makes it very difficult to do. There is another technique of perfusion called arterial spin labeling, ASL imaging, which doesn't require the use of a contrast agent. You don't have to use that dye. In fact, it's a, so it's a completely non-contrast technique. Potentially that has benefits to, to imaging all kinds of patients where we don't, you know, you have issues with IV access. Some people have allergies to the dye. Some people have kidney problems. Um, and, and those sorts of things, um, potentially. Now, it's just been less studied uh, compared with the DSC perfusion that I talked about. DSC perfusion is the, is the oldest MRI technique. It's been around since the early, late 80s, early 90s. The principles were, were de derived around that time from Harvard. Um, so potentially, but, uh, but it, it would be difficult to set up those sorts of maps because you need histology. And that's just really nearly impossible, very difficult with the IPGs. Okay, uh, a quick question on gadolinium. Is it safe to get repeated MRIs, just regular MRIs? Uh, some people up to like 20, 30 MRIs. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great question because there's, you know, in, in, the, in the popular press and everything, you're, you're hearing more about this GAT deposition disease. And I think it's certainly a, a, an issue to be aware of. However, you know, there's still no, no known clinically validated um, deleterious effects from it. So it just depends like uh, uh, if you have a brain tumor, I mean, you're, I think, I think it's just a risk benefit ratio. If, if, you know, you have a patient who's going to be living 30, 40, 50 years, maybe it's a consideration. Um, the dye has been used for, you know, for 30, 30, 40 years now. And I don't think there's been any study that has shown that it has, has any deleterious effects. There is obviously concern and people are trying to come up with better agents that are more chemically stable. Um, but it's just a risk to benefit ratio when you have, you know, potentially life threatening illness that can take your life very soon versus somewhere where you got, you know, 40 years to live. It's just a risk to benefit ratio. It's still incredibly valuable for us to know what's enhancing because we know that enhancing lesions are potentially bad. So it, it just depends on, on, on your own particular situation, whether you have a condition where it's kind of indolent and, and smoldering for, for, for decades versus something that could you know, be aggressive and, and take your life in a year or two. It's just a risk to benefit ratio. We, we still have to use it all the time um, for, for our studies. And, and you know, I understand the people's concern, but just scientifically, I don't think anything has been demonstrated that, that that the deposition itself that some people have demonstrated is clinically bad. Um, so there's a lot of people walking around with it that may have the, the GAD that is depos deposited. I've had a couple of gadolinium studies myself. Um, and uh, I, you know, I wouldn't get it if I didn't need to, but if you have something like a brain tumor, I think you definitely should get it. Okay. And finally, um, my organization is part of something called the Jumpstarting Brain Tumor Drug Development Coalition. Uh, 
one of the committees we have is called the Brain Tumor Imaging Standardization Committee. Right. About seven years ago, we came out with a standardization brain tumor protocol for just regular MRIs. Right. That would be the perfect place to also try to get these uh, FTB maps standardized. You right. should probably talk to this group. Yeah, no, in fact, um, in fact, all the, 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 the people that I talked about, they're part of that committee. Okay, okay. Kathleen, Jerry Boxman, all of these people who are the pioneers are all part of that BTIP, you know, FDA. Right, uh, the BTIP. Yes, BTIP, yeah. They're all part of that group. And um, they okay. have not yet. I just want to make sure, because sometimes there's silos where people don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> definitely. But these people are all on the BTIP. Okay, now. perfect. So we, we actually helped start the BTIP. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it for your part of the presentation. Uh, if